Section 16 of My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt Translated by E. E. Gulioff This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Through His Incarnation the Lord has entered into the closest relation with man. It is marvelous. God Himself is united in one person with man. God became flesh. The Word was made flesh. God himself partook of our carnal food and drink, was laid in a manger, lived in a house. He who cannot be contained by the heavens walked upon the earth, upon the waters, upon the air. He went up, it is said, toward heaven. He was nailed to the tree. He who hangeth the earth upon nothing by his command. The whole earth, the waters and the air, all are sanctified by the incarnate Son of God. Therefore the earth is dear to him, this temporary abode of men, this inn of the human race, this place of his habitation amongst men. But especially dear to him are men themselves, whose souls and bodies he has received into unity with his own person, and especially with true Christians. He is in them, and they in him. What is above all desirable for man? The avoidance of sin, the remission and forgiveness of sins, and the attainment of holiness. Wherefore? Because sins, such as, for instance, pride, evil behavior towards our neighbors, wicked suspiciousness, covetousness, avarice, envy, etc., separate us from god the source of life withdraw us from fellowship with other men and plunge us into spiritual death whilst gentle humble and kind behavior to all even to our enemies simplicity disinterestedness contentedness with little and with the indispensable generosity to every one good will and all other virtuous qualities unite us to god the source of life, and to other men by endearing us to them. Grant, then, Lord, that we may entirely flee from sin, that we may accustom ourselves to every virtue through thy grace. Yea, Master, Lord, without thee we, being evil, can do no good thing. We must not be exasperated, angry, and proud, as is habitual to our corrupt nature, against those who are angry, envious, or proud towards us. But we must pity them as overcome by the flames of hell, and by spiritual death. We must pray to God for them from the depths of our hearts, that the Lord may take away the darkness from their souls, and enlighten their hearts by the light of His grace. We are darkened by our own passions, and do not see the foolishness, the monstrousness of them, and of our conduct. But when the Lord enlightens us by the light of His grace, then we, awaking as from a sleep, clearly perceive the monstrousness, the foolishness of our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. Our heart, which was hardened until then, softens. The evil passes away and is replaced by mercy, kindness, and indulgence. Therefore, in accordance with our Saviour's words, we must also love our enemies. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For they, our brethren, are also blind, have also gone astray. This present life is a life of exile. The Lord God, it is said, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, and we, all of us, must earnestly strive to regain our country through repentance and works meet for repentance. Lord, the desired fatherland give thou to me, a citizen of paradise me making once again. The present life is the narrow way, the way of afflictions, privations, and maladies. The narrower the way, the more convincing, the surer it is, 
that we are going the right true way. The wider, the more certain it is that we are nigh to destruction. The present life is a daily, cruel, most bitter struggle against the enemies of our salvation, especially against the invisible, sub-celestial spirits of evil, who do not leave us in peace for a single day, but constantly make use of their craft and subtlety against us, kindling various passions within us, and wounding us in the most acute manner by their shafts. Remember, therefore, that an incessant war is waged against us, that there is not time to rest, to enjoy, and amuse ourselves in this life, which is given us for our preparation for the future one. Neither when we are tried by misfortunes, nor even then, when it seems to us we are perfectly easy and happy, as, for instance, when we give ourselves to pleasure at theatres or soirees, when we display ourselves in festive attire and ornaments, when we give ourselves up to the pleasures of the table, when we turn round in the gay dance, drive in fine equipages, etc. Amidst all your worldly pleasures, man, the greatest misfortune hangs over you. You are a sinner, you are God's enemy, you are in great danger of losing eternal life, especially if you live negligently, if you do not do works meet for repentance. The wrath of God hangs over you, especially if you do not appease the God whom you have offended by your prayers, penitence, and amendment. Thus this is no time for you for pleasures, but rather for tears. Your pleasures should be rare and principally such as are afforded you by faith, in spiritual festivals. God is an almighty power over all material worlds. More than that, He is a most wonderful, most merciful, and most just power over the spiritual world, that is, the world of angels and men. In His hands are all spirits, their peace and blessedness, as well as the anguish and torments of evil spirits and evil men. As we sometimes blaspheme the divinity by the impure, dark, and evil state of our soul, blaspheme the Father, the Word, and the Most Holy Ghost, the Comforter. So, on the contrary, some men, through the benign disposition of their souls, are capable of comforting all by their words, thus glorifying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The Almighty Lord His omnipotence embraces all creatures, the highest and the lowest, intellectual and sentient, angels and men, heaven and all that is therein, the earth and everything upon it, the sea and everything within it. His omnipotence absolutely embraces everything in general and every part of creation. Thus it embraces the heart of man and his thoughts. Therefore it is said, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. This is also why the apostle says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. If God's grace leaves my heart and my mind, I become as the dust carried away by the wind, without any moral stability, with an inclination to every possible evil. Both my mind and my heart become empty, trivial, dark, and powerless. The Virgin Mary is the most merciful sovereign of all the sons and daughters of men, as the daughter of God the Father, who is love, the mother of God the Word, of our love, the chosen bride of the Holy Ghost, who is love consubstantial with the Father and the Word. 
how can we do otherwise than have recourse to such a sovereign and expect to receive all spiritual blessings from her firmly purpose in your soul to hate every sin of thought word and deed and when you are tempted to sin resist it valiantly and with a feeling of hatred for it only beware lest your hatred should turn against the person of your brother who gave occasion for the sin. Hate the sin with all your heart, but pity your brother. Instruct him, and pray for him to the Almighty, who sees all of us and tries our hearts and innermost parts. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin." It is impossible not to often fall into sin, unless you have a hatred of it implanted in your heart. Self-love must be eradicated. Every sin comes from the love of self. Sin always appears, or feigns to be, to wish us well, promising us plenteousness and ease. The tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. This is how sin always appears to us. If guardian angels did not preserve us from the snares of evil demons, oh, how often we should have fallen from one sin into another! How devils would have tormented us, they who delight in tormenting men! which indeed happens when the Lord allows the guardian angels to withdraw themselves from us for a time, and devils lay snares for us. Yes, the angels of peace, our true guides, the guardians of our souls and bodies, are ever with us if we do not voluntarily drive them away from us by the abomination of sensuality, pride, doubt, and unbelief. We somehow feel that they cover us with the wings of their immaterial glory, only we do not see them. Our good thoughts, inclinations, words, and deeds all proceed from them. The enemy often wounds our souls by his malice, and burns us. This wound spreads like a gangrene in the heart if we do not stop it in time by the sincere prayer of faith and God wounds our souls by His love. But this wound is light, sweet, not burning, but warming and vivifying. Concerning Penitence Penitence should be sincere, perfectly free, and not in any way forced by any particular time and habit, or by the person before whom the sinner confesses. Otherwise it would not be true penitence. It is said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is at hand, that is, it has come by itself. It is not necessary to seek for it long. It seeks us, our free inclination. That is, you yourself must repent with heartfelt contrition. They were baptized of him, is said of those baptized of John, confessing their sins, that is, they themselves acknowledged their sins. And as our prayer consists principally of penitence and asking forgiveness of our sins, it must absolutely be always sincere and perfectly free, not against our will, not forced out of us by habit and custom. Such also should be our prayer when it is one of thanksgiving and praise. Gratitude supposes the soul of the man benefited to be full of free, lively feeling flowing freely from the mouth, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Praise, too, supposes an ecstasy of wonder in the man who contemplates the infinite goodness, wisdom, and omnipotence of God in the moral and material world and therefore it ought also to be a perfectly free and intelligent action. In general, prayer should be a free and perfectly conscious outpouring of the man's heart before God. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. In order to purify and stimulate our prayer, 
the Lord allows the devil to painfully inflame our inward parts, so that we, feeling a strange fire within us, and suffering from it, may endeavor to bring into our heart, by means of humble prayer, the fire of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost, giving life to our hearts. The Lord allows the enemy to tempt us in order to prove us, in order to strengthen our spiritual powers in our struggle against the enemy, and so that we ourselves may see more clearly towards what our heart inclines whether it inclines to patience, hope, and love, and in general to virtue, or to irritability, incredulity, murmuring, blasphemy, malice, and despair. Therefore, we must not be despondent, but must good-humouredly and patiently bear spiritual darkness that descends upon our soul the fire that weakens and inclines us to impatience and malice, the affliction and oppression, knowing that all these are indispensable in the order of our spiritual life, that by these the Lord is proving us. Do not let us blaspheme against the true way, the way of holy faith and virtue, and do not let us prefer the evil way, we are free, and must strengthen ourselves by every means, and with all our power in faith and virtue, unto the laying down of our life for the way of truth. And how can this be, if we have no temptations? The devil strikes the hearts of priests, with slothfulness, dryness, and barrenness, in order that they should not preach the truths of the gospel to God's people should not tell them the entire will of God. During prayer he also works upon the heart, and strikes it with insensibility, so that the prayer should not be sincere, but only said out of habit. He does not let the heart contemplate during prayer the greatness of all God's perfections, the greatness of the mother of God, that of the angels, and of God's saints. The devil is like a wicked, sharp-pointed needle, which, at every time and everywhere, gets into the eyes of your heart, dimming and eclipsing them. He is the poisonous dust which always flies about our spiritual atmosphere, and settles corrosively upon our hearts, eating them up and piercing them. He acts in the same manner upon some teachers of religion striking their hearts with dryness and oppression, in order that they may not teach God's truths sympathetically to the young branches of Christ's vine, nor water them with the life-giving streams of the gospel. Here is the society of men of the world. They go on talking and talking, for the greater part amusing themselves with trifles, and there is no mention of God, the common father of all, of his love for us, of the future life, of recompense. Why is it so? Because they are ashamed to speak of God. But what is still more surprising is that even persons deeming themselves pious, themselves luminaries, seldom speak of God, of Christ the Saviour, of the preciousness of time, of abstinence, of the resurrection from the dead, of judgment, of future bliss, and everlasting torments, either in their family circle or amongst men of the world, but often spend their time in futile conversations, games, and occupations. This is, again, because they are ashamed to converse upon such subjects, being afraid to weary others, or fearing that they themselves may not be able to converse heartily upon spiritual subjects. O oh, adulterous and sinful world! Woe unto thee at the day of judgment by the universal and impartial judge! He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Yes, the Lord and Creator of all is not received by us. He is not received into our houses, nor into our conversations. Or else, when a man reads a religious book, or prayers aloud, why does he sometimes do so as if against his will, reluctantly, 
his tongue hesitating. His mouth speaketh not out of the abundance of the heart, but out of straightness and emptiness. It can scarcely speak at all. Why is this so? It proceeds from the neglect of reading books and of prayer, and from false shame sown in the heart by the devil. What miserable creatures we men are! We are ashamed of that which ought to be regarded as the highest honor. O oh, ungrateful and evil-natured creatures! What torments do we not deserve for such conduct? When the enemy does not succeed in hindering the Christian upon the path of salvation by means of afflictions, oppression, poverty, and various other privations, maladies, misfortunes, then he rushes to the other extreme. He fights against him by his own health, tranquillity, softness, the weakness of his heart, the insensibility of his soul to spiritual blessings, or by the opulence of his outer life. Oh, how dangerous is this last condition! It is more dangerous than the first state, the state of affliction, oppression, of sickness, etc., in such a state we easily forget God, we cease to feel His mercies, we slumber and spiritually sleep. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. But in affliction we involuntarily turn to God to be saved. We constantly feel that God is the God of our salvation the God who saves, that He is our life, our breath, our light, our strength. Thus, it is better for the Christian to live in some or other kind of affliction. Prayer is spiritual breathing. When we pray, we breathe in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost. Thus, all church prayers are the breathing of the Holy Ghost as it were spiritual air and also light, spiritual fire, spiritual food, and spiritual raiment. Holy Ghost, all we Christians are, thy breath, thy birth after baptism. By thy first creative breathing into the person of the first man, we, all races of the earth, are thy breath, thy birth. Have mercy upon us, raise us up, Holy Ghost. Drive away from us by thy breathing the stench of our sins and passions, and uproot all our sinful inclinations. During prayer, always firmly believe and remember that every thought and word of yours may, undoubtedly, become deeds. For with God nothing shall be impossible. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. This signifies that even your words shall not be without power. All things are possible to him that believeth. Take heed of your words. The word is precious. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. The word is the expression of the truth, the truth itself, being and deed. The word precedes every being, everything, as the cause of their being, past, present, or future. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Thus speaks the creative word of the Father. In Him, in the Word, is the cause of all creatures, present, past, and future. Why do we honor the cross with such reverence that we make mention of its power in our prayers after asking for the intercession of the Mother of God and the heavenly powers, before asking for that of the saints, and sometimes even before asking for that of the heavenly powers? Because after the Saviour's sufferings, the cross became the sign of the Son of Man, that is, the cross signifies the Lord Himself, incarnate and suffering for our salvation. 
On the cross Christ offered himself as a sacrifice to God the Father for our sins on the cross, and by it he has saved us from the works of the enemy. And this is why we honor it with such great reverence, and therefore it will always be a great power for believers, delivering them from every evil, and especially from the evil action of invisible enemies. As light, air, and water are found together and mutually penetrate each other, and at the same time do not intermingle, each of them remaining what it was before, the light remaining light, the air, air, and the water, water, each entirely preserving its own particular properties, but the substance forming one matter, so also, in a somewhat similar manner, the persons of the most divine trinity are always found together, and are not separated from each other. The Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father, whilst the Holy Ghost proceedeth from the Father and resteth in the Son. But at the same time each person has its own particular properties. God the Father is not begotten, not created, does not proceed. The Son is begotten. The Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father, whilst the substance of the three persons is one, a divine, incomplex substance. This similarity is based upon the words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, who calls himself the light of the world, and thus speaks of the Holy Ghost, comparing it in its actions to the element water. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. He also compared the Holy Ghost to the air or wind. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Holy Church sings of the Holy Ghost. To the Holy Ghost belongs every all-saving cause, on whomsoever he, through worthiness, doth breathe, he quickly taketh him from earthly things. It is the same to the Lord to give flesh to any creature he likes, either to an animal or a plant, as it would be to me to make a garment or clothing and put it on myself. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and has fenced me with bones and sinews. And what an infinite multitude and variety of material the Lord has, out of which he, the Creator, creates various clothing, of various shapes for his creatures, animals, birds, fishes, reptiles, insects. And us he will eventually clothe with light, like unto of the sun in his kingdom. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in a vesture of gold. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And now we are clothed with the earth, water, air, warmth, such as our present clothing. And how wisely and conveniently all these elements are made and brought into union in our being. It is not heavy, and it is comely. O oh, most wise and almighty artist, life-giving artist, how beautiful, suitable, and animate is everything that thou hast created. At thy will even the dust is animate, the dust moves. The chief thing in prayer for which we must care above all is lively, clear-sighted faith in the Lord. Represent him vividly before yourself and within you. Then ask of Jesus Christ in the Holy Ghost whatever you desire, and you will obtain it. Ask simply, without the slightest doubt. Then your God will be everything to you, accomplishing in an instant great and wonderful acts, as the sign of the cross accomplishes great wonders. Ask for both spiritual and material blessings, not only for yourself, but for all believers, for the whole body of the church, 
not separating yourself from other believers, but in spiritual union with them, as a member of the one great body of the Church of Christ, and loving all, as your brethren or children in Christ, as the case may be. The Heavenly Father will fill you with the great peace and boldness. When praying, pay steadfast attention to the words of the prayer, feeling them in your heart. Do not withdraw your mind from them to any other thoughts. When praying during divine service, during the celebration of the sacraments, and the singing of the prayers and hymns upon various occasions, lay surely to your heart the words themselves of the church prayers, believing that not a single word is placed there in vain, that every one of them has its power, that in each word dwells the Holy Trinity, the Lord Himself, who is everywhere present and fills all things. Think thus, I myself am nothing, the Lord does everything. Also think, when I speak, God, the Word, speaks in me. I need be careful for nothing. Casting all your care, it is said, upon Him, for He careth for you. When you read a worldly magazine or newspaper, it is light and agreeable reading. You easily believe in everything in it. But if you take up a religious publication or book to read, especially one relating to church matters, or sometimes when you begin reading prayers, you feel a weight upon your heart, you are tormented by doubt and unbelief, and experience a sort of darkness and aversion. Many acknowledge this. From what does it proceed? Of course, not from the nature of the books themselves, but from the nature of the readers, from the nature of their hearts, and, chiefly, from the devil, the enemy of mankind, the enemy of everything holy. He taketh away the word out of their hearts. When we read worldly books, we do not touch him, and he does not touch us. But as soon as we take up religious books, as soon as we begin to think of our amendment and salvation, then we go against him, we irritate and torment him, and therefore he attacks us and torments us on his side. What can we do? We must not throw aside the good work, the reading or prayers that are profitable to our souls, but we must patiently endure and in patience save our souls. In your patience possess ye your souls, says the Lord. The same applies to theatres and churches, to the stage and divine service. Many people find it pleasant to go to the theatre, and oppressive and dull to go to church. Wherefore, because in the theatre everything is well suited to please the sensual man, and when we are there we do not provoke the devil, but please him, and he, on his side, affords us pleasure, and does not touch us. Make merry, my friends, thinks he. Laugh, only do not remember God. Whilst in the church everything is adapted to arouse faith and the fear of God, pious feelings, the feeling of our sinfulness and corruption, and the devil sows in our heart doubt, weariness, despondency, evil, impure, and blasphemous thoughts so that the man is not glad in himself, and cannot stand for even an hour, and he gets away as quickly as possible. The theatre and the church are opposite contrasts. The one is the temple of the world, and the other the temple of God. The one is the temple of the devil, and the other the temple of the Lord. When you are asked to pray that someone may be saved from bodily death, for instance, from drowning, from death through any sickness, from fire, or from any other disaster, commend the faith of those who ask you to do so, and say in yourself, Blessed be your faith. According to your faith may the Lord fulfill my unworthy, feeble prayer, and may he increase my faith. 
you easily forgive yourself if you have sinned against god or against men accordingly easily forgive other people too love your neighbour as yourself forgive him much how oft shall my brother sin against me and i forgive him till seven times i say not unto thee until seven times but until seventy times seven said the lord by this love is known even this is little for love to do love loves its enemies does good to them which hate it blesses them that curse it and prays for them which despitefully use it the lord unto whom all hearts are open knowing our avarice and trivial covetous calculation in those cases when we have to show hospitality and kindness to people from whom we do not expect to receive the equivalent has promised to remunerate us in the day of judgment not only for having given food to the hungry drink to the thirsty for having visited the sick and those in prison but he has promised a reward even for a cup of cold water given to a christian or to an unbeliever in his name whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only verily i say unto you he shall in no wise lose his reward o oh, the loving-kindness and mercy of christ who after this will not be ashamed of the hardness of his heart and his shameful avarice the devil as a spirit as an incomplex being can hinder and wound the soul by a single instantaneous movement of the thought of wickedness of doubt blasphemy impatience irritation malice by an instantaneous movement of any attachment of the heart to anything earthly by a movement of intuitive sight adultery and other passions he can fan the spark of sin with the cunning and malice peculiar to him into a flame raging with infernal strength within the man we must stand fast and strengthen ourselves by every means in god's truth rejecting the lies illusions and malice of the devil at their very beginning in such cases the man should be all watchfulness all eyes hard as adamant invincible in every part firm and invulnerable o oh, glory glory to thy victory lord thus may i conquer by the power of thy might the invisible and visible enemies all the days of my life until my last breath amen o simplicity of faith do not leave me end of section sixteen